Um, public space is something that belongs to all of us and so on. Um, I have slightly different views on it because as Louise have pointed out, as one of you pointed out, I'm a lifetime cyclist. This week I'm going to touch on a significant subset of public space being urban mobility. I've got a tiny problem here, which I just fixed. Um, I'm talking about urban mobility or specifically sustainable urban mobility. It is my experience and of others, part of the reason greater public space has not been reclaimed from cars is a lack of clear direction how to successfully transition to a car-free city. That means addressing urban mobility in greater depth. The need for sustainable urban mobility was unheard of 125 years ago when city streets, alive with people and animals and trees, somehow thriving via an almost organic sustainability if they weren't at war. The cities functioned well enough without cars to develop into the cities that we know today. People were everywhere as illustrated in the well-recognized painting of the Arc de Triomphe, only to be overtaken by the ubiquitous car and overtaken by pollution. For obvious reasons, the Paris Agreement and the European Union Sustainable Development Goals have pressed for sustainability of cities. If we go back just 100 years to Manhattan and look at the gentleman standing in the middle of the road. Once upon a time, people occupied the public space of streets so that today cars occupy the public space of footpaths. The causal link, air pollution, suddenly became obvious to everyone. It's easy to assume that the lockdown could become a mobiliser for systemic change, but has it been effective? Read the text carefully, as many articles were published, drawing attention to sales of bicycles have skyrocketed, including e-bikes. Fearful commuters shunned public transport if they could, and anyone in the bicycle industry have just had the best summer ever. I have a lot of happy friends. <laughs> Municipal authorities rushed to accommodate commuters opting for soft mobility. With frequently knee-jerk reactions by increasing bicycle lanes, yes, quick and inexpensive, on the surface of it, claims could be made that we are witnessing tactical urbanism as a driver for systemic change. But from the standpoint of sustainable urban mobility, I'm not so much convinced. There was a predictable pushback and claims of killing trade on high streets, that somehow extra bicycle lanes were unfair on motorists. Is this tactical urbanism leading to a systemic change? With COVID and clean skies in the rear view mirror, a lot of stakeholders are now making noises about a return to the way it was pollution or no pollution, so long as the driver is not inconvenient, resulting in anarchy and resentment. Look closely at the image and the claim, roads for residents. Actually, that means roads for cars and pollution only. Well intentioned as the increase in bicycle lanes may have been, I see more harm than good to the two-wheeled fraternity. In Mike Leiden's definitions of what is tactical urbanism, the point 100% transparent in intent and execution appears to be much lacking in this scenario. In Italy, some of the urban mobility and public space changes have been better received. However, they predate COVID-19. Urban mobility, the act of transporting oneself between home and office doesn't all have to be fueled by polluting engines. 
there is something we call human power. It's very sustainable, very environmentally friendly, resilient, and so on. And human power is what has built cities for millennia. The problem is current iterations of human powered vehicles, generally known as bicycles, may be highly efficient machines, but amongst other limitations, are catastrophically unsafe. With a serious spike in fatal accidents for cyclists since COVID changed our streets, the apparent tactical urbanism bicycle response does not appear to have ameliorated sustainable urban mobility. New bicycle lanes will not solve mobility problems until we start to rethink the very vehicles that we use. Solutions to urban mobility don't have to be binary, just two or four wheels. Automotive manufacturers, on the other hand, though, seem reluctant to change, preferring, preferring to dream that we all enjoy traffic jams and problems with parking. Classic thinking, buy electric vans. But how does that work in European cities? until we start to recognize the value of human powered vehicles. You may be surprised what can be carried on the simplest of bicycles. Yes, my, my vision broke down recently. Sustainable urban mobility has not evolved in response to COVID-19. Some of us have been working for years on solutions, even when tactical urbanism drives systemic change in other aspects of public space. If there is going to be systemic change in uh, sustainable urban mobility, there has to be a change about the types of vehicles we use. Solutions have come and gone, failing, for a plethora of valid, even good reasons. But genuinely sustainable urban mobility is only just around the corner. It is only by thinking outside the box will we see entirely car-free cities emerging in the very foreseeable future. Then interdisciplinary collaboration will be required to transform public space, to encourage mobility solutions that you haven't even seen yet. That is when tactical urbanism interventions will become more effective for suburban mobility. Our seven minutes are up. I will get off my bike and uh, leave you to enjoy the rest of the presentations.